All right, so here we are with AEAPD Online Live, and today we have Beverly and Edian from uh, to talk about social learning, as well as Nancy uh, Moval from AEAPD Online, uh, who is coordinating things uh, K-12. So, um, Beverly and Edian, uh, why don't you just kind of introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit how you got started around this arena of social learning. Well, it's already depends how far back you want to go, but, but uh, I was a teacher and then I became a, a researcher in artificial intelligence application to education. That led me to join an institute called the Institute for Research on Learning, where a number of scholars from different disciplines came together to rethink learning. And I was working with an anthropologist there. And this is where I became interested in the social aspect of learning, because in computer science, we were more looking at more like the informational and, and cognitive aspects of learning. But the, this, these anthropologists were looking at, uh, uh, you know, how society becomes a context for learning. And so this is how it started for me. All right. And Bev? Well, for me, I was, uh, mine was back in the 80s. I was actually shadowing a a human resource director of a multinational company. I was interested in that time in international communication and how it, it, she was a Portuguese woman and what would the, um, what made her a successful businesswoman in, the, in an international world. And I was intrigued by the way that she drew on her friends and colleagues from previous uh, companies and how much time they spent informally talking by email, having lunches and dinners together, and actually how much work they did in making sense of their lives in the international world in those, in those times. And so that got me interested then in, in the whole social learning theory. So really that networking and how it really created more than just getting to know each other, but the learning that happened in that networking. How, how, how significant it was for her learning. And when I, um, when I validated, I, I had all sorts of findings. I had five main findings from my research with her. And I showed her the findings and she zoomed in on this one, which was called Communities of Practice. Because I said, what she had formed there was a community of practice. And she said, and I described it there, and she said, oh my God, this is it. This is, this is what I'm doing. You know, this is how I learn. This is what's important for me. And so I kind of knew I was onto something. All right. So why don't you uh, define for us what, when you think of communities of practice, how do you define that? How do you explain that to people? Well, very simply, we define it as a learning partnership among people who care about something and want to learn how to do it better together. So it could be a group of engineers in an engineering company uh, learning how to put better brakes on cars uh, in different, in different uh, uh, departments, or it could be a street gang learning how to survive in a, in a hostile environment on the street. So you can find these kind of learning partnerships in very, very different contexts. They are not necessarily good for the person, it's not necessarily good for a person to be on a street gang, but this is how they learn how to, how to survive and how to be who they are, in the same way that an engineer learns how to be a better engineer in that, in that context. So thinking of um, that social learning and those communities practice, how has that, have you seen that start to spread in the realm of K-12 education? In fact, we, we, our work takes us way beyond education. In fact, the, uh, in fact, education has been one of the last to jump on the bandwagon. First, it was business, so we've seen it a lot in business. Uh, international development, uh, we see it a lot in international development. And, and slowly now, well, uh, yeah, now um, uh, education is, is hopping on board. And uh, in K-12, in fact, it was through the work of uh, Nancy um, that we have mostly seen what's happening in K-12. Okay. And I would say in education, the relevance of what we're doing is at two levels. Uh, it, it's at the level of 
forming communities uh, among teachers or among school administrators uh, and among professionals in education more generally, uh, uh, course designers or, or what, what have you. And then there is the whole relevance of, of, of the theory to curriculum and to pedagogy. And this is still a rather unexplored territory, we believe, because there is a lot of potential to rethink some of our institutional arrangements from the point of view of social learning from the point of view of the kids. Okay, thank you. Nancy, how about you jump in with some questions here? Okay. So as you're looking around the, um, and working around the world in, uh, you know, all manners of sectors, are there certain attributes that you find help particular communities of practice or social learning environments or systems be more effective? What's working out there as you look at this, this realm of social learning? Perhaps the, the first thing that we see is when people care about something. You know, when people are really passionate about something they want to know how to do well, then those communities thrive. That's, that's the, the first element, the first essential element, we would say, you know. And then um, probably another factor which is uh, high up on the list is I mean, when you've got a group of people who care, that you've also got within that some people who are prepared to take leadership uh, in getting things done. Some people who are prepared to put in just that little bit extra to make sure it all works and goes ahead. So that's, that's a key element, is that internal leadership. And I think related to that, there's also external leadership. What we've found is that if people really care about something, but they live in an organization, when whenever they express that care, people say, why don't you measure this instead, you know? Then all of a sudden, that care disappears, and then, it, then communities are difficult to sustain. So there is also a kind of supportive environment, you know, because institutions sometimes have a knack for taking the caring out of people's work, you know? And so we, we find that when that's the case, it's very difficult for communities to sustain a long time because people feel like, well, we do all this stuff, we engage ourselves and so on and so forth. And then the organization just either slaps on us on the head or, or doesn't, doesn't see what we're doing. And the other thing is that uh, when people are so busy, even with the internal leaders, I mean, if you've got like a team around who are following and helping to put things in the right position for people to take up when they're ready. So having some kind of support team around a community of practice. So if you've got people caring and you've got internal leadership, then what you need is a good support team around it who are <coughs> ready to, yes, ready to oversee the whole big picture and, and put things in the right place for that community. You know, that makes me think when you were here in 2011 and you, um, la we launched our community of practice in Iowa and we held a workshop in two days. And at that workshop, I think that you implemented some particular strategies around that idea of kind of that shared community, but also shared leadership. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, you really created I think it really brought forth the passion and that that willingness of this group to carry on some hard work. Could you talk a little bit about maybe some of your um, strategic planning about how you designed that workshop and what were those elements that carried forth that also allowed for the, the group to take up some distributed leadership? Well, I suppose, I mean, we always start by thinking of um, Yes, we're creating a social space in which people can take ownership over the process, but also uh, really delve into the content of things that they really feel passionate about. And uh, so it's always like a, a fairly, fairly structured, but really structured not around content, but around creating the space in which people can do things. And 
I have to say, it's not always easy for people who are putting on workshops to be able to do that because people are afraid to let go. They want to bring in the content rather than really trusting that people will work hard on those things that they care about. So we've got a sort of a number of um, practices and techniques that we've developed over the years, which we've seen manage to bring out people's sense of caring and passion and helping them to work on those things that they've, uh, you know, that they've identified. Yeah, and so we, we bring people into conversations around questions that they have that, that they keeps them up, up at night, you know? And then they discover this partnership. They say, oh, so, so you too, you, you are kept up at night. Well, maybe if we, if we started to work together, like, like your, your, your logo, I am better together. Yeah, if we start working together, maybe we can make progress faster. So we, we structure the conversation in such a way that they can discover that learning partnership with one another. And we do build in some kind of, um, we, we open the space for people to take leadership through what we call leadership groups. So, I mean, we've, and these leadership groups have come about because we've seen that communities of practice that uh, work well, they pay attention to certain processes. So, for example, they pay attention to a shared memory that they create among themselves, which acts as a resource going, going ahead. Um, we've noticed that people who pay attention to the, the, the message, the, pay attention to the external stakeholders of the meeting and, you know, craft messages for them rather than busy just simply getting on with their business. Um, We've noticed that people who pay attention to the issues arising and that people care about and that need to you need to pay attention to in the future. So there are a number of things that we've actually, processes that we've noticed um, uh, in successful communities of practice. And we now uh, have a leadership group for each of those processes. And so we invite everybody at the meeting to be one in one of those leadership groups and to steward that element of the process. And we give them time in the meeting to actually do that, to reflect on it together, and then at the end of the meeting to make recommendations for going ahead, for crafting message for the outside, for creating a shared memory. So we, we actually allow quite a lot of time in the agenda for people to start to take ownership over the process. And this is because we have noticed that uh, in the beginning, communities are often often depends like on one person taking a lot of leadership, and as they mature, then people discover that they can also take leadership. So in a way, we find these leadership groups as a shortcut to mature a community a little faster, if you will, by allowing in a sort of game way, you know, and saying, yeah, you, you join this leadership group and you pay attention to whose voice is being heard and who's, who is not. And by that, we accelerate the maturing of a community into a into a, a, a social space in which people take ownership of what happens. And often one of the things, because something we see is that communities that uh, might hiccup a bit are when a convener or the person bringing people together feel like they have to do everything, that they are responsible for making this go right. And um, so... <laughs> With these leadership groups, what we do is distribute that responsibility. So the responsibility for making it go right is, is among the leadership groups and not among the convener. And uh, that sort of shift really is an, is an important one. And the convener often feels like, if I make it go right, then later on I can let people to do things. But what we do is try and bring that in right from the beginning. But what we've noticed is actually, it doesn't diminish the role of the convener. Mm -hmm. Because what we've noticed is actually facilitating these leadership groups and, and, and having the sensitivity to make the process go right is a very critical success factor. And so it takes an, it's an art to do that well. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think as we've discussed, that's even a new leadership role that you're finding is this people who can work across systems. And um, I know we talked about horizontal and vertical up and down the systems as well as across these systems. Mm -hmm. um, what are the th so I want to go back to these distributed leadership um, 
weird titles or, or and t tell me about the fluidity of those roles. Do they, should they stay, and maybe you don't even have a sense for this necessarily because I'm sure that they'll move in and out of those roles as need be, but is it something that they would take on until they decide that that's no longer the role that they choose to be in or is it something that, you know, for the good of the group, if you could just hang on with this role, these, you know, the next year that we meet or something, what's that look like in um, mature communities? Well, in communities where they've kept the same roles, I have quite often really tried to make them shift roles after a while because it gets stale and you start, you, you it's quite good to have, because um, those roles can be interpreted in so many different ways that it's quite good to get them to change every every now and then. Um, although, well, I mean, it's really a trade-off because there's the, over time, people get better at doing it. Uh, but at the same time, you don't want it to get stale. So, I mean, it's a kind of, we always recommend that people keep those same roles, say, for example, for a year. Uh, but that's a little arbitrary. And I've, I would be paying attention to how that was going before I fixed that in stone. Very good. And from your perspective, is there a particular profile of a person who thrives in this type of environment or this type of learning system? Have you noticed anything along those lines? We, we, would, we, would, like, we would prefer to believe that everybody can learn how to do that, but we're not sure. Okay, because we see some people who are very good at it and some people who, who, who have difficulty with it. And I would be, you know, part of me is tempted to say, yes, I've seen, in, you know, those people who are, who are more reflective, more able to deal with um, chaos, more people are prepared to take initiative. I think, I, I mean, I could say that that kind of person is more likely to thrive. But actually, when I look back at people who have thrived, I've constantly being surprised at you get yes you get this sort of very pompous you know hardcore person who you never imagined would you know would take it up and then they do so i mean it, it's yes, too some hard. engineers for instance who are more like on the autistic scale you know they are more towards the autistic you know <laughs> but some engineers have been artists at doing that you know yeah because they care because they love the the problem, they love a question, they love something difficult, so they, I don't know, it gels. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. At the, yeah. Same time, mm -hmm. at the same time, I think we should say that when people are doing that well, they are artists, you know. So it's almost like saying, is it a special profile, somebody who can be an artist? I don't, we don't know, you know. But people who are good artists, you, they, you know, you see it when you, you recognize when you see it, this is a person who is, who, who really is very, very good, has that sensitivity, they can use who they are as a wellspring of inspiration. Now you're talking about a leader of a community practice, yeah, but, as right. a, but as a normal member. Oh, I see, okay, yeah. okay, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. As a normal member, yes, it, in theory it could be anybody. And in fact, I, I think that I would say, because often when I start off with clients, they will say, oh, well, you, you know, you've never seen anything like our group. They're so conservative. They, um, you know, they don't talk to each other and it's all terribly complicated. And you really, you know, it's going to be very hard. And it's, I'll tell you what, it's always much less hard than they thought. As long as they're ready to let go, you know, often the idea that it's hard is because they're trying to control it. And then that becomes a self fulfilling uh, cycle. But for example, I, one of the most thriving communities of practice that I work with is uh, internal auditors in Eastern Europe and Russia. Now, internal auditors in the public sector. Now, shall I tell you, those are the most dynamic, excited, productive community of practice I've ever worked with. And in the beginning, they said, oh, no, never. <laughs> and, and we would have believed it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, accountants, accountants, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so you no. think just waiting for retirement, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's no wonder they're, they're so happy. They're passionate about what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So when 
when you think about that and that kind of need to let go, how is that that you then also can go back to your sponsors or those uh, who are maybe supervising or overseeing or in leader, you know, in key leadership positions that would say, well, if you're letting go of control, how do we know what you're doing is having a positive impact or that it, there's some effectiveness in, in our case, changing teacher practice and teacher behavior and ultimately student achievement how can we be sure that that's going on if, if it's lacking control and structure? I think for a start, I would never use the words letting go control to a sponsor. I mean, you are, in fact, there's a very careful control, you know, mm -hmm. of, of a sort. It's just not maybe the traditional kind of control. But, um, and, yeah. But I think... We are also talking about a slow revolution here in organizations because there has been a long trend in organizations to ensure quality by replacing local intelligence with systems. And we are saying, no, we need to create places where local intelligence can be engaged, where professionals can actually engage their local intelligence with the situation. You see, you see what I'm saying? And it's a different, it's a, it's a bit of a shift in how do you ensure quality control? Because the quality control, through, the, the, the quality assurance through control is a very industrial model and it works well in an assembly line. But in most jobs today, full control actually is counterproductive, you know? And I would say, especially in K-12, you know, especially in K-12, if you think that you will achieve high results by tight control that replaces the intelligence of the teacher, you are not gonna achieve what you want because a teacher who is successful is a teacher who is passionate, is a teacher who is engaged, and if you just shut that by very strict control system, you are working exactly against the very thing that you, that you, the very quality that you want. Believing that you are actually ensuring quality, you are ensuring lack of quality. So I think that there is a bit of a sh change of discourse. And it's not one of control versus not control, I would agree with that. But it's one of, what does it do to local intelligence? when you try to replace it with vertical control systems, you know? And is that, I'm sure it is, is that in the literature somewhere? Because I think there, this would really be a major shift from where we've been lately in education, or maybe we've been here over the past 25 years or, or longer, but that whole notion that uh, we will look at the research and we must replicate this research to fidelity, which means someone knows what this research is and then imposes it on the people who need to replicate this. And it seems, I mean, I, I couldn't, we may have to cut this out, Rob, but I couldn't agree with you more. I think what we're doing is killing off the very people who are, do have the passion and who are closest to the work because somebody from somewhere thinks they know how it must be done in order to take what some research said in another locale and place it here and now it's going to magically work again. Um, so and, and is there a place that we can reference that so that there's, because there's also this need for me to legitimize that, hang on, this is a place for us to consider a new way of learning, particularly when you think about technology and learning across systems in between districts in our case. Yeah, I don't know if that, that the argument, the way we were putting it, is in the literature yet. I mean, we are writing a book on that, and I think it's so <laughs> well, they, a shameless <laughs> central promotion once again. A central tenet of that book is going to be that, that that tension between the vertical kind of control and the horizontal kind of intelligence, and 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 not to deny one or the other. You see what I mean? Th that researcher who did careful research, we don't want to just dismiss what, they, what they've done, right? But it's very different when you impose a research outcome 
through fidel through fidelity of, of implementation and when you give this as a resource for a community to negotiate among themselves what what they can do with it you, you see what i'm saying and, and then also have that you know that it as we started out with that initial um definition is that they have their problem to solve that they're passionate about and they want to be working toward um, resolving that problem um, so there does, there has to be that meeting in the middle or some whatever that looks like I can That's certainly right. yeah. see that um, another question I had is because I know that this is some new work I believe you're doing is on that whole notion of the um, value creation and how we could maybe use that type of that kind of the, the story of our work as a way to um, honor and uh, get, for lack of a better term legitimize that we are having successes based on maybe a new way of gathering that information and putting it into this uh, value creation story could you speak to that does that uh, well I mean this value creation framework that you are referring to was a response to, you know, people always ask, so how do we know that we get value, you know, when people just get together and talk about, talk shop, you know? Um, it's not like a team where a team is accomplishing something and you know it gets value because it delivers the, the thing on time and within budget. Okay? So in a community, it's much more subtle because the value of a community of practice often happens outside of the community when people go back to work and do things better. And so it's not necessarily very visible inside the community. So this is how we've developed this framework of telling stories of how the value created within the community uh, uh, translate into improvements in practice where the members of the community take what they have learned and apply it. Now, we are also I think that when we, when we say stories, some people think, oh, this is just anecdotal. So the framework that we have developed is actually much more rigorous than that. It's telling very, very specific kind of stories with respect to very specific kind of indicators. So it's really a mix of the qualitative and the quantitative to make a case for the transformative effect of a community on the practice of an organization or a group of people or something like that. And are you finding that that e evaluation of the, the um, effectiveness of these communities is something that um, is being addressed all over the world? You know, I, this summer I know I worked with somebody from Shell Oil Company and I think they have to address that same issue. Is, how is it that others are addressing this evaluation of is this the right work and, and is it successful? Well, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, more and more now, I mean, in the beginning, in the first sort of initial phase, you know, people thought communities of practice were a good thing. And then they had them and people said, oh, no, it's ever too difficult to measure. Uh, but now we're seeing, I mean, it is very important to, yes, evaluate whether or not, especially as you know, finances are budgets are being cut, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, people want to know: is this working? So more and more people are now having to evaluate uh, community practice. And I mean, people get uh, people often I mean, they, they they take the measurements. Um, they take just one dimension of measurement. That's what's happened. So, for example, people say, well, we get feedback from all our meetings. This tells us whether or not it's successful. Uh, other people say, well, okay, so we want to uh, see uh, what people, um, uh, how much people put this into practice, for example. So that, I mean, that's a slightly more sophisticated one. In our framework, we measure all the different dimensions and use those stories to make the causality clear between the network activity and how it finally plays out in, for example, it would be in school, you know, school, the retention rate of, uh, of difficult students. So to make the connection between uh, yeah, a network, a community activity and the, you know, better success levels of the school. 
So that's the idea of the stories. And it's becoming, I mean, it's uh, more and more people are using, well, using our framework, but more and more people and organizations are realizing you have got to do this evaluation, otherwise we're going nowhere. Right. Right. But we, actually, we should say that these, these evaluation processes, like all learning processes, really depend on, on good measurements of performance, on meaningful measurements of performance. And I think it's a bit more difficult in education than in business. Okay. In business, you were talking about this person from Shell. If a community at Shell can, can avoid them to drill a well that's going to be dry, right? They save $20 million or something like this. You know what I mean? The measurement of the value of that is fairly si simple. Mm -hmm. I think in education, we have to be much more subtle about reflecting on the very things that we measure. Are they, are they the right thing? And are they the, 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 the ways that the value of a community can be seen, you know? Yeah, and that, that becomes a big issue um, for our work, I believe, is yeah. that, you know, eliciting a, a picture of that value for people to know and understand. So, um, no, but I think, case, imagine, imagine, for instance, that teachers become inspired and that in turn inspires students. The, the notion of stories would force you to say, okay, can we follow that all the way into you know, the, the experience of a student, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we could be that, get to that level at some point, um, that'd be fabulous. Rob, do you have any other questions? Um, I have a couple. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, you talked about uh, there needs to be both internal structures in place to help support those communities of practice, as well as some external fa factors that help support that. I'm thinking of it in terms of like principals who might be supporting teachers who want to participate in one of these communities to practice. What are some things that they might need to keep in mind so that they can best support their teachers who are uh, working within a community like this? Well, I suppose, I mean, one, one, one important thing that might be so obvious, or perhaps it's not so obvious, is to give the teachers time, time to do it. Uh, because actually, the more uh, involved and engaged you are in a community, the more, I mean, it can really eat up your time. So, but actually having time and not just thinking it's something you do on the weekends is very important. And the second thing that, that we would want a principal to really consider is if you have that community, you cannot control it. Because if you try to control it in a traditional sense, you kill it, as we were talking about before. But at the same time, engage with it. Listen to what they are saying. Uh, have have some, some, some role with respect to that community. Because there's nothing as frustrating for a community to come up with a great idea. Fantastic conversation. Wow. And then that idea just peters out on some shelf somewhere. You know? So... Give, give those, student, those teachers time to engage in that community, but then respect the work that they are doing enough to see what, how the school can benefit from it. And it could be, for example, having a monthly or six monthly or semesterly meeting or, or discussion with the community about you know, some of the ideas that they've had and, and really look at how they could be put into practice and um, seeing ways of integrating without incorporating, but integrating what they're coming up with, what the community is coming up with, with some of the more possible formal documents that are, or formal things that are produced by the school. I don't know if they have a school newsletter or a, a school website, but it's, you know, these kind of things are coming from our community of practice for teachers, you know, thanks very much, or giving them a little, shining the spotlight on them uh, when they have things to contribute. Uh, another another question I had was thinking about we have some communities that have been going for a while and it's really about not only getting started but sustaining the practice and keeping the community going and keeping that from fizzling out as you mentioned earlier. So what are some things that you've seen communities do that help 
keep that momentum going, keep it, keep uh, working, and um, keep on creating new things from it. Well, the first thing to say is that, in our opinion, no community should live a second past its usefulness. Okay, so there's nothing that says that all communities should last forever. You know, once a community has achieved what people were expecting, or if there are no more problems to, to address, I think that community should disappear uh, very quickly, you know. So, so sustaining a community should not be a goal in and of itself, but communities that have sustained over time have kept bringing in, bringing in new challenges uh, that have engaged people. You know? So I think, I think that, that the, the length of sustainability of a community really depends on the length of issues um, that keep coming up. So in a very dynamic field where you constantly have new things, you, you have a community that is, that is probably going to be uh, likely to have lots of meeting uh, um, and, 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 and very dynamic in a community where the changes are pretty slow and new problems come in, come in very rarely. Maybe that's a community that has a completely different rhythm, you know. But it's a matter of, of, of engaging with relevant issues. Sometimes communities, I mean, it's hard to sustain themselves because they become almost victims of their own success. because. Once they start having more people or getting more things done, that creates more work. And it also creates a lot more sort of administrative work. Suddenly you've got to find a bigger room. Suddenly nobody's got time to make some notes or put things up on the wiki. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of sort of small annoying things that never get done, but which sort of need to be done to facilitate the process. And some communities have then, uh, you know, tried to get money from somewhere to to actually pay somebody to do it, to pay somebody to do the, the more boring things. Um, and and that, that can be helpful too. So not to assume that the community has to do everything, but to think of outsourcing some of the, yeah, some of the more boring stuff so that when people actually do come together, it's really high value for time. You know, that you triggered a thought about the um, voluntary nature of a community. Could you sp speak to that as well? So that can people move in and out and that's okay? Or what are the expectations? Usually when we work with organizations, we tend to recommend that participation in communities of practice be left voluntary. That's kind of like a general kind of rule of thumb, but it is not a strict principle. Because, I mean, in some sense, on a day-to-day -day basis, the engagement is going to be voluntary or not. Because you can force people to go to a meeting, but you cannot force them to find value in that meeting and become engaged, right? So, in the end, it's always voluntary. But some schools, for instance, have found that it is important to have a structure of time. There was a school in Australia, I remember, where the principal told me she had negotiated with the school board to free teachers for one hour on, on Wednesday afternoon, I think, to be able to participate in the community. Because of union issues, there it was very important to, to formalize that time and give it a formal structure, not, not so much because of the community, but because of the surrounding uh, uh, environment. And to me, that's fine, you know? Okay, teachers, union rule says on, on uh, uh, Wednesday afternoon from 3 to 4, you belong to your committee of practice. That's your committee of practice time, you know? It, it's, it, it, some people say, oh, no, this is too formal. No, that's fine, you know? As long as the teachers find that a meaningful way to engage with each other and that it helps them in their practice and it helps bring that, that identity of the teacher out, uh, the fact that it is a specific time designated for that, I, I, I don't have a problem. And back to your question of people, you know, moving in and out. In, if everybody's just moving in and out and nobody's actually, you know, driving the process or if there's not enough internal leadership, then it might end up being a little, a little vague or a little wobbly. But, you know, that can be okay, okay too. Some communities of practice are very fluid and just sort of like come together at certain moments, but most of the time it's people coming in and out. And that works for them. 
but others, it doesn't work so well. You need a strong core, core team. It depends on what people actually want to do together. And in certain organizations today, participation in a community is not compulsory formally. But if you have, if you are responsible for a very important practice, right? If you are an engineer, and maybe you know, if you make a mistake, some some customers will be killed or something like this. And your manager sees you are not participating in the in the community where this is being discussed. People will say, "Wait a minute, are you being responsible here?" You know, it's like you, you need to follow the practice. You need to follow those discussions. So there is also a cultural element to. To that, you know, even even if formally it is not compulsory, there's an expectation that if you are a, pro a, a professional, and for me it, that's kind of interesting, you know, if you are a teacher. For me, if I was a principal, I would want to know that my teachers talk shop, you know, I would not want a teacher who is just by themselves, kind of like, you know, because. Being involved in talk shop about your practice is a very important part of the identity of a professional. You know? and, and I think where the community of practice becomes so strong is that that shop talk becomes about their problems. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, they are working together to solve the, you know, this common problem they all have. And I really do think that that has had high value within our own our Iowa community of practice sharing in that problem solving. Uh, one last question, and this is really more of a uh, little marketing pitch. So if you were going to give a one minute marketing pitch to why teachers in Iowa um, should join a communities of practice, um, what would you say? To teachers or, or to, to administrators? Well, let's start with administrators, and then we're going to go to <laughs> teachers, and then we're going to go to the legislators. So you just make that however you want to talk. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, I can't think for the administrators at the moment. It might come to me, but I was just thinking for the teachers. I was thinking, uh, well, it's not a, a minute. I'm just thinking, you know, why would you bother doing something on your own when you can do it with other people? Uh, you know, that if there are other people thinking about the same issues, get in there. Yeah, and one of the problems in, in education that we've heard teachers talk about is the loneliness of being a teacher. The only time you have someone else in your classroom is when you are inspected, you know. And so, you know, all professionals need to be engaged. And that's what I would say also to, um, to a principal or to an administrator, you know. If you knew, if you had an engineer in your in, in your if you if you're a manager in, of an engineering community and you knew that an engineer did not want to go to any conference about engineering you know what I mean you would you would say you are not a responsible profession right? so make sure that your teachers have a space where they can where they have the freedom and the time to engage with other professional in professional conversations that's an that's an essential element. Reflecting on practice is an essential element of professional professional identity and professionalism. You know that if you don't have that, you can, you can hardly call yourself a professional. So that was to administrators. To an administrator, yeah, yeah. And now legislators. I'm, that might be too hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I really just sort of threw that in there. <laughs> No, but you could say something similar to a, to, to a legislation. You know, you, you could say, okay, we understand that budgets are tight. We understand that, that, that time is precious. But in one industry after another, people have found that a very small portion of time, doesn't have to be much, you see, it's maybe an hour or two every month, dedicated to professional development in the context of a community of practice, not just sit, not just bump on a seat in a lecture, but engaging with other professionals, whether it's within your school or, 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 or within the regions or whatever, it's a good, one industry after another I have found, this is a good investment of people's time. And we should value that enough that we don't expect them to do it on Sunday on their own time, that we should include that in the budget. <laughs> 
All that's right. going to do it. So, well, thank you two very, very much. I really appreciate your time with us. Um, and with your permission, Rob's going to work his magic and um, do some editing. And um, we'll go from there. And we, again, we so appreciate your knowledge and your expertise in this field to help our practice move along. So have a great seven weeks out on the road. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Etsy. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And we'll send we'll send you the links when it's all up and finalized here. So hopefully in the next week or so. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yep. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 -bye.